Hi everybody, and welcome to Take a Tour of the new Microsoft Office, our webinar today on February 1st, 2013. For those of us on the West Coast, this is still morning, but good afternoon to everybody um, else in the United States that's attending today. Just a little bit about ReadyTalk, which is the webinar tool that we'll be using. If you have any questions, whether or not it's about the content or how to use ReadyTalk, um, or basically any questions that pop into your mind, you can ask those via your chat box. Um, everybody is going to be muted today, but you can still ask those questions via the chat box. We will be trying to get to all the questions that come in either in that chat box or read audibly to all the presenters um, at question break um, throughout the, at, in the middle of the webinar and at the end of the webinar. If for some reason we do not get to any of your questions, we will be following up with you following the webinar. So never fear, we will get your question answered. If for some reason you do lose your Internet connection, you can reconnect to this webinar via the link that was emailed to you. So just the same way that you connected the first time, you will be able to just get back in there that same way. And just as a reminder, we are recording today's seminar. So if for some reason you do need to leave the webinar early today, or you just want to review the information that is for provided, you will be able to view this um, recording. We will be sending out the recording to everybody this afternoon. Everybody who registered for the event should get that, that email. And we will be eventually putting that up on the TechSoup website. So again, this is Take a Tour of the new Microsoft Office. We're really, really excited about this webinar today. I first want to go ahead and give a big thank you shout out to Microsoft as always. They have been such great part, uh, product, do, uh, product donors for us. And I'm just really, really excited that they are participating on this webinar today. If you want to take a look at information about new Microsoft Office products available through the Microsoft Software Donation Program, go ahead and um, open up this bit.ly. Um, you'll need to just go ahead and type it in your browser. Um, you might want to do that after the webinar, and I will share that at the end of the webinar as well. And we will be emailing this link out to everybody as well. So a little bit about the presenters today. My name is Kyla Hunt. I'm the facilitator. I'm the webinar program manager here at TechSoup. And with us today is David Alexander from Microsoft. David is the Product Marketing Manager on the Office Technical Marketing Team at Microsoft. In his role, David manages demo strategy across the Microsoft Office division. Also with us is Jenny Meese, or Jenny Meese from TechSoup. Jenny is a content curator at TechSoup. Before coming to TechSoup, she was the senior editor for PC World, where she covered mobile phones as well as consumer advocacy issues for both the website and the print magazine. And for all those librarians out there, you'll be happy to know that she's currently in her final year at San Jose State University School of Library and Information Science. And assisting with chat, you might see these names pop up in your chat box. Becky Wiegand from TechSoup, Christian Dio from Microsoft, Don Reed from TechSoup, and Cameron Jones might be um, stepping in as well. So a little bit about the agenda today. Um, First, Dave is going to take the reins. He's going to be talking about giving us an introduction to the new Microsoft Office as well as a demo and tour. Then we're going to stop, look at what questions have come in, maybe read a few to David and see what he has to say. And then I'm going to hand it over to Ginny who's going to take that basic tour of the new Microsoft Office and kind of bring it into perspective for the nonprofits and libraries out there. And so the first section is just going to be kind of an overview of what Office has has, um, has to provide. And then the second half is really going to be geared towards the nonprofits and libraries. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and let David share his desktop, unmute himself, and take it away. All right. Hello, everybody, uh, and good morning, good afternoon for those on the East Coast, and good evening. I even saw someone uh, I believe from South Africa on, uh, on the call here. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and talk to you today a little bit about the new office. 
Um, as some of you may have seen, uh, just on Tuesday, uh, we released uh, the, new the new Office for uh, Consumers, our home premium offering on Office 365. Uh, it sort of represents a, a revolutionary new release for Microsoft. Uh, and in general, this new version of Office that we're coming out with right now uh, is a pretty big step for the company uh, and a pretty pivotal, pivotal time uh, for Microsoft in general, not only in Office, um, but across the company for things like Windows uh, and the Surface uh, and Windows Phone and everything else. And so uh, it's really pr a pretty pivotal transition time for Microsoft uh, to be becoming a services and devices company. Uh, and the new office actually plays pretty heavily into that. Um, I think I have actually uh, a very, very fun job at the company. I really enjoy what I do, which is basically I get to show off the product. I get to play with toys uh, all day long, so to speak. Um, uh, if you consider software uh, a toy. Uh, and my job is basically to do demos and talk about what the new office really looks like um, when you actually dive into the product and, and click and play around with it. Um, before I actually show you live product, I do want to tell you just a little bit about the new version of Office uh, and the things that went into the way that, uh, the way that we built it. Um, there, are, there are sort of three major influences uh, depicted here on this slide uh, that were really front and center when we were developing the new version of Office that I'm about to show you. Um, one of the first things is this, is this notion of devices um, and device proliferation. Some of you may have heard of this concept of uh, the consumerization of IT, um, or you may have heard it differently, but what this really means is more and more people are bringing their experience with software and with devices on a personal level in their consumer lives, they're bringing those expectations to work. And they're expecting the same level of technology, the same types of devices, the same level of capabilities from the technology at their workplace as they have in their personal lives. People are becoming less and less patient with a company that might be on you know, one or two or even three versions of a product that are older uh, than the one that they're currently using in their personal life. Um, and alongside that is just the number of devices that people have. People are on the go with smartphones. Um, right now, based on Forrester research, uh, it's estimated that there will be about a billion smartphone customers uh, by 2016. Uh, that's a very, very large percentage of the world. Um, and so what the experience for productivity looks like, not only on the traditional PC, but across devices like tablets and phones, or even new types of devices like large screen touch devices uh, and displays, all of those experiences are things that we had in mind as we developed the new version of Office. The second thing you see here, people. Um, the way that people want to get things done is also changing. Um, and there are a lot of generations in the workforce. Actually, this is the first time in modern history that we actually have about four generations of, uh, of people in the workplace. Um, and so we have newer generations, particularly Generation Y, that have different expectations of work and life that come from experiences with cloud technology, cloud email, cloud collaboration, and other things like that, um, maybe in student projects that they did in college or even high school. Um, and, you have, uh, and you have generations that go all the way up to the workforce that's about to retire. And those folks have had uh, technology you know, at various points in their, in their working lives, but probably not evolving and changing as quickly as it is now. And so we've thought a lot about how to accommodate all of those generations and provide revolutionary new experiences that still don't alienate anybody. So we make the technology very accessible. The last thing on the right here is cloud. As I said, it's sort of a pivotal moment for Microsoft where we're really transitioning to a devices and services company, and we offer a lot of services. Uh, and this is the first release of Office that is really uh, available front and center as a cloud subscription offer. Um, of course, we are still offering on-premises versions of the Office products. So you can still buy Office 2013 uh, and install it on your physical computer the way that you've been used to. Um, but we are now offering a subscription where you can keep your version of Office up to date perpetually uh, if you're a subscription customer. And that goes for both consumers as well as businesses. And you can see here on the right there are just a couple of statistics about the rate at which companies are starting to think about the cloud uh, and adopt pieces of the cloud. A lot of people take for granted today that, uh, that uh, an email experience that we are all very familiar with, probably in our personal lives, uh, is actually cloud computing already. Email has been one of the first workloads, um, both on a personal and professional basis, that has moved to the cloud. 
Um, and things like storage for documents and collaboration and other types of um, productivity uh, software are also moving to the cloud and companies are looking at that. As I said, we are still offering on-premises versions of all the products, both client like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, everything like that, as well as the server products, Exchange, SharePoint, Link, and everything. Um, but we're also offering cloud versions of those products. And we're giving companies choice about whether they deploy on-premises, completely in the cloud, or whether they have a hybrid of the both um, that they want to coexist together and look like a single organization with some users on-premises, some users in the cloud, but still have it look and feel like one company. And so that basically brings us to what the new office is all about. And it really is summed up by four pillars here, devices, social, cloud, and then control. Um, I'm going to go through these just really quickly, but I think uh, I'm actually going to spend most of my time on, on demoing it and showing these, these key notions through the demo. But devices, as I mentioned, we're really trying to create a great experience for the new version of Office on all sorts of devices. Of course, Office is great with mouse and keyboard as we've always been uh, as we've always been with previous versions. But we're also taking touch into account, stylus, pen and ink into account. What experiences for productivity look like on a touch first device? Um, so you'll see some of those um, you'll see some of those features play into uh, the demo that I do in the new version of Office. The new version of Office is very social. And we don't just think that social is a place to go like a traditional newsfeed type of thing. We think that's a part of it. And having an enterprise social capability in your workplace can be a part of what social means. But we think it also includes having social activity um, be a part of every part of uh, how you work. And so having good representations of people uh, or understanding what people are up to while you're communicating with them in different ways. Having asynchronous as well as synchronous communications or real-time communications. And having all those abilities right at your fingertips so you can choose the best way to communicate with someone given the type of activity you want to do, we think that that's part of what social really means. And then cloud, as I talked about, cloud is a big part of the release, not only in the way that we offer it, um, but in the way that some of the features come to bear. Uh, and, and that's not just for people that go with Office 365 and use the cloud offering. For the on-premises versions, Office 2013, uh, the version that you can install in the traditional fashion, you still have a lot of cloud benefits accruing to those customers as well. Because a lot of the things that we did to design the product to be very cloud ready mean that you'll get scalability benefits or access and um, connectivity benefits on the on-premises versions um, just as a result of the way the product was designed from the ground up. And then less pertinent to, to today's conversation, but particularly pertinent to IT professionals and folks in the organization that manage uh, the office deployment, we've done a lot on the control compliance side of uh, the new version of Office to really make Office a, a, a top grade uh, product for companies that really want to make sure that data is protected and compliant. Um, and so with that, I'm actually going to, um, going to end the presentation here and actually just start showing off the product. And so the first thing that I actually am going to do, I'm going to open a different PowerPoint presentation here. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is actually start in PowerPoint. So this is the new PowerPoint, PowerPoint 2013. Uh, and there are a few things that you might notice about this version of PowerPoint. The first is that it actually looks a lot cleaner. We've done a lot to really clean up the user interface and help people stay focused on the content that they're working on and not as much, uh, and not as much the Chrome uh, or the uh, navigational elements surrounding the content that they're working on. Of course, all the controls that you've been used to uh, for the ribbon, for example, are right here when you need it. So you can just tap or click to expose the ribbon. But a lot of these elements disappear and don't take up space when you don't need it. And this is particularly important for smaller screen sizes that people are using more and more, like tablets uh, or smaller Ultrabook PCs that they're, that they're using at work. Of course, people still use large displays, and this is going to work great on that. Um, but we're helping to really keep people focused on what they want to get done not how they do it. The other thing is for people with touch, um, we've integrated into Office a new touch mode. And you'll see when I tap here in the top, um, you'll see that I can tap between a mouse mode and a touch mode. And the mouse mode basically contracts everything, makes it a little bit smaller. But if I use the mouse and come up here and click into touch mode, you'll see that everything expands just a little bit larger to make it uh, more touch friendly and the touch targets are a little bit larger. So you can see we're really trying to have the single version of Office accommodate both people with mouse and keyboard uh, as their primary method of use, as well as folks interacting with Office with touch. So the next thing that I want to talk about is a very common scenario with PowerPoint, and that's presenting a, a PowerPoint presentation. 
there's a statistic, and this is definitely common here at Microsoft, that people spend about the first 12 minutes of a meeting in a conference room actually doing things like messing with a projector and dealing with projector settings on their laptop to try and actually figure out just how to make a PowerPoint presentation work and show up properly. Well, in the new version of PowerPoint, Office works with Windows to mess with the Windows projector settings. So all you have to do is literally just press the Present button up here, and it goes ahead and launches that presentation. And if you're connected to a projector or a second monitor, it will automatically extend your screen so that that projector is showing the slides while your personal monitor actually shows you a very touch-friendly presenter view, which I'll show you now. So I'm actually going to launch that presenter view from down here. Again, if I were connected to a, uh, an external projector or another monitor, they would still continue to see that full presentation taking up the entire screen. But I have this set of presenter controls right here at my fingertips. It's sort of like a cockpit for your presentation. It gives me all the things that I need to be a confident presenter without uh, sort of betraying any of that additional information to the audience. So it lets me be confident and focus on the presentation and not so much how I'm actually going about it. You can see that on this presenter controls here, I have a view of the current slide. In the top right, I have the view of the next slide. Down here, I have a view of my notes, and I can scroll through these notes if I want to get uh, a view of all my notes. I can resize everything if I want. It, and you can see I'm doing this all with mouse. I can also do this with touch. You'll see the little black dot, which represents my finger uh, where I'm touching the screen. And then I can also do things uh, in this presenter dashboard, like zoom in on a particular slide. And so I can choose, hey, let me zoom in right there. If there's a particularly uh, uh, zoomed in part of a diagram, maybe I want to uh, zoom in down here on this sort of March 1987 area. And so you see that these presenter controls help me be really effective without having to think a lot about how to do it. I can focus on getting my message across and communicating with my team rather than what the software is actually doing to let me do that. There are other things that I can do as a presenter uh, including things like using a laser pointer, uh, or I can do inking. And you can see that I'm doing this with a mouse, um, but I can do it just as easily with a stylus. And so I'll take this and sort of you know, cross out a word or two here. And so you can see that these presenter controls are very touch friendly as well. So you can imagine that this is great for a situation where maybe you want to present off of a tablet, especially as wireless display technology becomes more and more prevalent. You can imagine just walking into a conference room, connecting wirelessly to a projector, and walking around the room or the stage with a tablet in your hand, presenting really slick and confident uh, as a presenter. So that's a little bit about PowerPoint. Now I'm going to flip over to Outlook. I'm going to come back to my Windows Start screen here and tap into Outlook. And I'm going to go back to my inbox here. And so again, you'll see, you'll see the same notion that I described with PowerPoint. You can see the user interface is really cleaned up, again, helping the user focus on the content, not necessarily the Chrome. And you can see, again, I have this touch mode that if I flip between mouse and touch, you can see that the controls expand. And in touch mode, I actually get these controls on the right over here to mark as unread, delete, reply. So I can do a lot of these things uh, in a touch-friendly way. I also can do things uh, like instead of actually having views of the calendar or people pinned to the side and taking up more room like we used to uh, in the last version, I get peaks at that information. And these peaks are interactive. So I can actually go ahead and, and click through different days to get a view of my calendar, or I can go ahead and look at my favorites, or initiate a quick search of uh, people across my organization uh, to get a quick view of them. Again, this is available to me just when I need it, and it's not taking up space on my screen when I don't need it. Other things we're doing to help, uh, help uh, preserve screen space uh, include inline reply. So I can now type a reply here. You know, sounds good. Um, and if I go to a different email, that reply will actually be saved in line with the rest of the conversation. So I don't need to go searching through the drafts folder to go find it. And at the end of the day, maybe if I've started composing a whole bunch of emails, uh, I can just sift through my inbox and see which ones I need to finish uh, typing and send um, before I go home. Again, keeping it part of the conversation. The next thing that I want to show here uh, in the people peak uh, is a view of the person card, uh, the people card rather. 
Uh, and this is one of the pieces of Office being social that I discussed. So here we have Molly Dempsey. And wherever you see a person's name in Office, you'll be able to get a card like this for that person which shows all sorts of information about them. In this case, I may have a few different contacts saved for Molly. You know, I might have Molly's cell phone number. I have her personal email address. I have her work email address. And instead of actually showing different contact cards for each disparate piece of information, I have a single card for Molly that's showing me all the information about her in a single place. I only know one Molly, so it makes sense that I would get all the context on her that I need in a single place. That can bring me information about the organizational structure, or even bring in social network feed information if my company has allowed that. And so you see it really lets me get context on Molly um, uh, right through this single card here. And if I go anywhere else in Office, again, I see Pavel here. I can hover and get a view of that card uh, just by expanding that here. And that's consistent across the entire Office experience. The last thing to show here in Outlook uh, is a new app model. Uh, that we have where basically any web developer can become an Office developer and embed uh, and use their programming language of choice to actually embed uh, contextually appropriate information into the Office experience. And so you can see there's a, there are a couple apps showing up here above this email. Because there's an address in the email, the Bing Maps app has been triggered. And if I just expand that here, it will actually show me a Bing Maps uh, map pulling in web data against that address to show me a live view of that data. And it's interactive too, so I can just you know, pinch and zoom. I can you know, twist this around so I can get a lot more context and bring in relevant information through that app right into my Office experience. I don't have to go to a separate website or app to get that uh, contextual information. So again, it helps me complete flows that I want to do and get more information right in context um, and help me be more productive and focus on what I'm trying to get done, not what app I'm doing it in. So the next thing that I want to show is I want to show Word. So I'm going to come down here and open up Word. And you'll see that the Start screen actually looks a little bit different. The first thing is we know that most uh, users actually resume working on a document that they were previously working on. So instead of putting you into a blank document, we're going to show you your list of recent documents right here on the left. So you can easily click into a document and resume working. If people don't want to resume working on a previous document, we know that a lot of those users want to actually get some help with the template. And so we have a lot of great new templates uh, and connectivity to template services on the web through office.com that pull in templates that help people get started with really rich, professional, beautiful looking documents as simply as clicking to select any of them. You, the third thing that you'll notice in the top right is that uh, in this case, uh, I'm demoing as Katie Jordan. Um, Katie is logged in. So there's now a notion of being logged into Office. This is particularly relevant for, for people who subscribe to the service because you'll log in, and so it's your cloud identity following you. But even for on-premises customers, when you're logged in with your organizational credentials, you'll be logged in and you'll have all of your custom dictionaries, your recent documents list for things that are uh, synchronized with company SharePoint sites, um, all of those things will follow you based on your identity. So this notion of it being your office, kind of wherever you go, it being very personal, is a, big, is a big new change for Office. If I go ahead and click here into the Northwind proposal, you'll see that it goes ahead and launches that document. Uh, and then because it knows me, it's my office, there's this little toast that comes up that says, Welcome back. Pick up where you left off. And so I can click here and resume working immediately in that document uh, in the place that I was last working, letting me pick up where I left off, even if this is a new machine that I haven't been using before. Because I'm logged into Office, my identity is tracked along with Office, which includes all of the metadata about these documents that are synced through the company SharePoint site, or if I'm uh, in the cloud that are synced across the cloud. So the next thing that I want to show is a very common situation for people who work with PDFs. So in, in uh, Office 2010, we introduced the ability to save to a PDF. But a very common problem for people has been, well, if I have this PDF, how do I actually edit it without having the full uh, PDF product? And so what a lot of people will do is they'll, they'll select all, they'll copy, then they'll come back into Word, and maybe paste it here in a new document, and you'll see it loses all of that formatting that it previously had. And this can be very frustrating, especially if you were the author of that PDF in the first place. Maybe all you want to do is change the date uh, or do some other small change. Well, with the new Word 2013, you can actually go ahead and ingest a PDF and open a PDF in Word, and it will preserve that formatting, but it's a Word document. 
So you can see I've just opened that PDF, but it's a Word document. I can highlight, I can edit some text, and I can resume working immediately as I want to without getting stuck on all these file conversion issues. Again, Office is helping me focus more on the flow and the type of work that I want to get done, not how I'm doing it or what app I'm in. The last thing that I want to show here in Word is Word has always been great as an authoring tool, but as a reading tool, um, we've introduced this new read mode for folks that are on the go with Word documents that want to consume content. And we've done a lot of research into what, uh, what type of reading experience is, uh, is pleasing um, and, uh, and how to reflow text. I'm going to uh, reflow my original document. And you can see this read mode takes that Word document and presents it to me in a touch-friendly, kind of reading-optimized view. I can swipe through it, um, or if I come to a small graphic, I can just tap on it to zoom in, or zoom even further uh, to get a view, but it doesn't take up the whole screen when I don't need to look at it. Or if maybe I'm on a plane or something like that, I can change the, I can change the, the lighting um, the lighting scheme here to make it more easy to read or change it to sepia or something like that. So you can see we've thought about what these new scenarios on more than just PCs actually mean for Office, what it means to consume content on the go with a touch-friendly device. I'm now going to flip over to Excel here. So this is Excel 2013. Um, and along the same lines of making content more accessible and the power of Office more accessible, um, we have a new feature called Flash Fill. So a very common scenario here is I have a whole bunch of data that's been kind of munged together. You see in column B that there's a whole bunch of data with event codes and names and things like that. And what a lot of people would traditionally have to do is, is uh, either develop some sort of complicated macro, which not a lot of uh, normal people know how to do, uh, or they'd have to just start rekeying, retyping that information. But the new feature called Flash Fill actually lets you start typing. So I'll start typing John and then Jenny. And you can see after just typing two cells, Excel has actually inferred the pattern I'm trying to complete and giving me the option to just press Enter and complete that pattern. And you can see that basically what's done is it's, it's saved me the work of having to redo, uh, redo all that data. I can do the same thing with events and then advertising. And you can see it's smart here with that third uh, that third cell, <coughs> digital marketing, it's pulled out both of those words. And you can see with just four cells, I've actually rekeyed this information, and now I have a whole set of data that's, that's uh, nicely formatted and ready for me to do some analysis on. Excel has helped me get from data to insights quicker without having to focus on all sorts of deep, complicated things to get that data formatted properly. Along the same lines, we now have a, a, a tool called the Quick Analysis Tools, which give me sort of live previews of what different types of charts or formatting might look like for this data. So I can just sort of hover over these different options and get a live preview with my data of what that type of chart might look like. So I can, uh, I can very easily and visually understand what the best way to represent my data is. Maybe it's a, a clustered column chart or a pie chart. Maybe it's a table, a different table, or a pivot table. Not a lot of people know how to create pivot tables or even necessarily what they are, but you can see here just by hovering that there's a very powerful, uh, compact view of this data that's uh, available to me. And so I can just click and get a pivot table just as quickly as, as I did with a single click here. Again, helping me get from data to insights quicker and get the technology out of the way of the person that's trying to be productive. The next thing that I want to show is, that, is one of the ways that the new version of Office is particularly touch optimized. So we still have all the products for the desktop as you've been familiar with in previous versions. But now with the Windows 8 uh, experience in the Windows 8 store, we now have this new class of touch first immersive content applications that are available through the Windows Store. And we've released two of those for Office. One of them is OneNote, which is a note-taking application. And so this is an immersive, touch-optimized version of OneNote. We still have the desktop version of OneNote 2013 available, um, but this is completely touch first. And you can see it prioritizes all that content full screen. I can just sort of swipe to expose my different notebook lists. Um, but when I am dealing with my content, I can just have that take up the full screen here. And because it's a touch-first application, we've thought a lot about how to actually let people do rich things with their content in a touch-first way. So you can see I can just use these touch-friendly uh, handles here to highlight some text. And then this A comes up on the right here. And this is what we call the radial menu. And this is a touch-optimized set of controls for dealing with that text. So I can just swipe to get this sort of speedometer type of thing, maybe to change the, the font size. That looks pretty good. Or maybe I want to change the color. And David, I can swipe just to, out here. 
And David, just to interject, um, you have about yep. five minutes. This is probably Sounds good. Thank you. Um, I can swipe here to get different colors or even a richer palette of blues. Um, or, I can sh or I can tap back and get some, uh, get some formatting options. So you can see that a lot of rich capabilities right at my fingertips, uh, literally. If there's no text selected, you can see that this radial menu becomes a little bit different because the app is uh, able to infer that without text selected, I may want to input some content instead of edit content. So it gives me options using touch-friendly controls to input content, whether it's a new table or a list or a set of to-dos, or in this case, the device is aware that I have a camera built in. And so I can go ahead and, and use that built-in camera to insert maybe a, a photo of a whiteboarding session or some notes. Here I have a piece of paper. Maybe I want to go ahead and, and add a couple of notes here. You know, hey, add uh, the new TV to this list or check the specs. I can just tap to take a picture and then use some touch-friendly crop handles. Maybe I, just want, uh, maybe I just want the note that I wrote to myself. And I can just dump it right there into the OneNote notebook. And because this notebook syncs across the cloud or a company SharePoint, I can make this available to other members of my team or access it from a different machines. And you can see I've gotten this rich content right into my notebook uh, using only touch-friendly uh, controls in this touch-optimized version of OneNote. So that's a great example of how we've built Office to be really, uh, really great on Windows 8 devices uh, and thoughtful about touch experiences. The last thing that I want to show in, uh, in just the couple minutes I have left um, is Link, which is our real-time communications client. And I'm actually going to go back here and tap into Link. So you can see here, this is, uh, this is the Link uh, buddy list, which is uh, akin to any other instant messaging uh, and presence application. You have a list of buddies, and so you can have folks from your team. Um, we're also federating with Skype, and so you can actually have uh, folks you communicate with from Link to Skype. Um, we have instant messaging presence and voice uh, enabled at this time. And so this is a really great way to keep in touch uh, with your colleagues. And so really easily I can just hover over a name here and initiate maybe an instant messaging session or a call or a video chat. I can just say hi to Alex here. Uh, and then you know, Alex can type right back, hello. Um, or you can also schedule link meetings. And so I have a link meeting already scheduled here uh, as part of an Outlook meeting. And I'm going to go ahead and join that meeting. So with just a single click, I can go ahead and join, and it will connect me uh, to this meeting that Alex, uh, it looks like Alex Darrow is already in the, in the meeting here. Um, and I think Alex is already sharing his video. Uh, in this case, Alex's video is me talking. Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, and I'm Katie Jordan, remember. And so I can very easily go ahead and start my video. And I get a little preview here first to make sure that you know, my hair looks OK um, or everything's good before I start my video. And then you can see just as easily as that, I'm in a rich uh, video conferencing call with somebody else using the power of Link right here embedded with Outlook. Um, and if there are folks that you want to join your call that don't have Link, you can still have them join using the Link web app. Uh, and so you can broadcast uh, or integrate people outside your company into this link meeting experience uh, and rich video conferencing um, as well. And link meetings are not only about video conferencing and the voice aspect, but it's also about sharing content. And so you can see here, if I hover over this icon here, there are different types of content I can add. Maybe I want to share my desktop or share just a specific program or do a joint whiteboarding session or take a poll. Or maybe over here, I can add notes to this, uh, to this link session. And like I described before, we can use a shared notebook that everyone on the team together can go ahead and add notes to it, and we can collaboratively take notes during this meeting. Or a very common situation is presenting a PowerPoint through the link meeting. And just as easily as this, I can click PowerPoint and upload this PowerPoint presentation into the meeting and use the meeting set of controls to go ahead and control that presentation. And so I can go ahead and I can just click through the different slides. Again, there are some, there are some controls here that we can annotate uh, this presentation if maybe we want to go ahead and you know, cross out uh, or make some changes and talk about this as a team. And everybody that's on the call uh, can go ahead and do this annotation. So you can see that uh, Alex Darrow is, is putting some check marks over here uh, next to other, uh, other pieces of this uh, chart. And so we can go ahead and collaborate together on this presentation um, and discuss it real time. So that's just a quick hit of, uh, of Link uh, and the entire Office 2013 uh, experience um, and, the, and the new Office in general. With that, I think my time is just about up, so I'm going to return control back to the slides, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll continue with the next portion of the presentation. So thank you very much.
Thank you, David. I do want to go ahead and take a look at the couple of questions that have come in um, and then go ahead and give it over to Jenny so she can um, give us a perspective of how nonprofits and libraries will be using this. Um, this question had been um, addressed a little bit in the chat, but I thought that it was a, is a good question. Um, people were wondering, so would you recommend using um, the newest version of Office just in Windows 8? So, uh, so Office continues to be available for uh, the Mac. We released Office 2011 for the Mac um, uh, a little while ago, and we continue to make improvements on the Mac platform as well. And so customers can still get Office for Mac uh, as well as Office for Windows. The new release that we announced on Tuesday uh, is for Windows specifically. Um, but we also, you know, I was talking about um, Office on mobile devices previously. Um, we have already had uh, Link and OneNote available on other mobile platforms like iOS uh, and Android for folks to do things like note taking and join Link meetings and be a part of this collaborative uh, type of meeting process um, using, using other types of devices. So Office is really, we are thinking about other platforms besides uh, Windows, but of course, uh, since you know Office is, is from Microsoft, we're, we're going to have a great experience on Windows, um, but we also are uh, conscious of the fact that folks use other devices and platforms to be productive, uh, and we want to be sensitive to that too, and uh, be able to offer a great productivity solution there. Okay, great. And we did have a couple of follow-up questions to that, asking about using it on Windows 7. Yep. Um, so Office uh, Office 2013 is available for Windows 7. Um, the the immersive touch application for OneNote that I showed um, is something that's specifically available only for Windows 8 because it's one of these Windows 8 store applications that, um, that run out of that new operating system. But everything, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, uh, OneNote for the desktop, Link for the desktop, um, those are all available on Windows 7. And you can see that actually I'm running them here um, or in my demo you could see that I was running them there um, all out of the desktop mode of Windows 8. Um, and one of the things that's very important about Windows 8 is anything that runs uh, on the desktop in Windows 7 will work on the desktop of Windows 8 as well. So, yes. <laughs> okay, great. And I do want to make sure to give Jenny some time, and a lot of these questions we can handle either at the end or after the webinar. Um, but we did have a question wondering if Link allows recording. Link does allow recording, um, but uh, it's something that is not going to be on by default. Um, so you have to consciously turn it on, and then there's a, a warning that pops up to everybody that's on the call that uh, the call is being recorded. So you make people aware that, um, that the recording has started. Okay, great. Um, with that, I do want to just go ahead and give it over to Ginny. Um, but David, um, definitely hang around for the questions at the end because we do have a lot of questions um, still to cover. So with that, thank you, David, for that really great demo. That was really fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> I'll go ahead and get you started and take it away. Hi everyone, and thank you David for that excellent presentation. Um, I'm going to show, be showing you guys some ways you can use some of the features that David showed in your nonprofit or library. Um, as Kyla said, I am the content curator here at TechSoup, and I've been spending the last month immersed in Office and finding ways to solve little day-to-day -day problems that come up in uh, the typical nonprofit or library. So I'm going to show you my next slide. Um, so I came up with these little fictional people that work for fictional organizations, but they're problems that pretty much all of us have every day in our, in our daily lives. Um, so this guy is a volunteer coordinator, and he's never at his desk. He's hardly ever in the office, but he needs to access all of his work email and his spreadsheets. So office is uh, – the whole Office suite is connected to the SkyDrive uh, service, which is Microsoft's cloud storage service. So you can actually save your Word documents or your Excel files to SkyDrive and then access them later from either your mobile phone or your tablet or another computer. And you can do that by using Office Web Apps, which is Microsoft's cloud version of the Microsoft Office suite. And you can access these documents within your Internet browser. You can view documents, and you can do some light editing as well. So moving on to our next problem, 
uh, this person, is it Rachel, is an event planner at the Northern Neck Food Bank, and she needs to create flyers, but she doesn't have any design experience, and she doesn't have a budget for uh, hiring a graphic designer. So as David showed you, there are these new landing pages that come up in all of the office applications, and particularly the Word one is really interesting for this person's situation because she can search through the templates and find something for like a fundraiser flyer or a newsletter template, um, and they're just right here. And you'll see templates that you might have not considered previously or you had no idea existed. So it's a really useful feature if you want to do something really cool in Word, but you're not really sure where to start. And another really useful uh, solution for this person is the new image formatting features in Word. Uh, previously, in other versions of Word, sometimes it can be kind of tricky getting your text and your image to align and work together, and sometimes you ended up just spending a lot of time trying to fit your image in and resize it and whatnot. So uh, Word has these really new, easy image formatting uh, options. Um, they have something called alignment guides. And basically you just drag your image around, and the text will automatically reflow to format around it. So it will save you a lot of time, um, whether you are creating a newsletter or a flyer or just want to make a really nice pretty Word document. So moving on to our next problem. So this is a problem I personally have as a writer at TechSoup. I do a lot of writing, and it goes through multiple hands, and it goes through a lot of edits, and there's lots of comments. And sometimes it can be hard to keep track of these comments. So this person, Allison, she's a grant writer, and her projects are reviewed by multiple people, and sometimes she can't keep track of who's commenting on what and what's already been fixed. So there are some new uh, collaboration and sharing features right in Word. You can email your documents directly from Word. You don't need to close out a Word, uh, you know, open up Outlook, reattach. You can just do it straight from Word. Um, you can also invite people to view your document. You can present it online. It makes it so much faster because you don't have to move through multiple applications to share this with your uh, colleagues. And so going back to the comment problem, um, these new, there's a new uh, view in Word where you can opt to either see all of the track changes or you can switch and just see where the changes were made um, within the document. So there's, you, you can either turn it off or on seeing all the track changes so you can more easily wade through what edits you've already done. And there's a new commenting system as well. You can actually reply to other people's comments. And when you're done dealing with that comment, you can gray it out so you know that you've already finished working on it. And let's move on to the next scenario. So James is a program analyst, and he's looking for new ways to present the organization's data in Excel. But he's not really sure what his options are, and he doesn't really have a lot of graphic design experience or infographic experience. So in Excel, you, as David showed you, you can select your data, and you can uh, see some of your options for presenting it. It's called Quick Analysis. And you can either choose to display it as a chart, or you can do it as a table. And you can, do, um, you can preview the different ways that you can view this data um, right within Excel. And so you can kind of measure what your best option is and the best way to display it. It doesn't require any extra skills. Excel really does all the footwork for you. So you can create really professional pr presentations and not have to relearn Excel or be an advanced user. So our next scenario is presentation anxiety. Um, you want to create a really, this person wants to create a really impressive presentation, but she's not really so great at PowerPoint, and she is a little intimidated by it, to be frank. And as David showed you in that, in that excellent demo, um, you have so much more room for creativity in PowerPoint. And there's new templates to choose from. There's new themes. You get a big space to work with. There's alignment guides just like I showed you in Word where your text and your images reformat. Um, so you don't have to like, really mess around with it. It's a huge time saver. I can create a presentation in 10 minutes that looks really professional, and I don't have any design experience. So it's, it's a really, really useful feature. 
And this next feature applies to both Word and PowerPoint, and it's something I think that would be really useful for nonprofits. You can insert a video directly into your Word document or your PowerPoint by searching either through Bing Video Search or YouTube. You don't have to close Word, open up YouTube, search for a video in YouTube. You can just insert it directly. And so if your organization has a, like a fundraising campaign video or a video that just kind of shows what your organization does, you can easily search for that video, pop it into your presentation, and then play it without having to like open up an you know, Internet browser. So you have to be connected to do it, but I think it's an excellent digital storytelling tool, and it really gives you a chance to make your presentations shine and add a little bit of an interactive element to them. So this is a problem that I think everybody has, and it's too much email, overwhelming amount of email. Sometimes I look at my inbox and I don't even know where to start. So these changes in Outlook that David showed are really, really useful for just getting like a nice big glance of what you have to deal with for the day. You can opt to see a couple lines of your email in your inbox. Um, and so you know like, whether it's important or not. Um, and you also can see your inbox as well as the email all in the same view. So it's like a really nice one glance look. And then you can start to parse through the email and it makes your day go by so much easier. And the same thing with the Outlook calendar. You have so much more information in one place. And especially useful to me is this little weather widget that's at the top. You can see whether it's going to rain, and then if you need to reschedule something because it's raining, like an outdoor fundraiser, you can just easily make that change. There's just more information in one place is a great thing, and it saves a lot of time. And our final scenario is organizing notes. If you're like me, I take notes everywhere. I don't know where they are. I lose them. I don't know what happened to them. And OneNote is an excellent way to keep track of these notes. It's really like your virtual notebook. It even has those little tabs that you can section up so you can keep all of your fundraising ideas in one area or your content themes or your social media campaigns. And really, I mean, it's, it's up to you to how you use it. Um, as you can see, I drew a little picture. You can use your mouse to draw pictures. Or if you have like a tablet or a phone, you can use your finger and use the touch screen to actually draw an image. You can insert video. You can insert photos. You can insert text. It's really up to you, but it's a really excellent organization tool, and um, it makes my day-to-day -day life a lot easier. So, Problem solved with Office. Um, I think you guys will find these new, use, these new features really useful. And um, little things that you didn't even know that you could do, you can do them with Office. Um, it's, yeah, it's been a really big help for me personally. Okay, great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, that was a really, really great kind of just re-emphasis of everything that is new in the new office, and then also what will be really helpful for nonprofits and libraries. So I really appreciate that. Um, I know we just have a ton of questions that have come in, so I'm going to go ahead and take a look. And a lot of these questions could probably be answered by either David or Jenny. So um, it looks like Brian was wondering, does Office 2013, or the new version of Office, use the same file format as um, the old version of Office? Yes. It uses the same uh, version of file formats that Office 2010 uh, did. So the docx, xlsx, pptx, um, no change in file format from the previous version. Okay, great. Thank you, David. Um, Al Alethea was wondering, the information outlook for the contacts, um, she was wondering, is it provided from bots, or is it manually added through human interaction? Um, so everything that you put in will be input by you. So, you, so if you want to use your uh, social network connections to show that information, you need to log in to Outlook with your social network credentials. Um, and there's a place in Outlook that you can do that. Um, you're only going to be able to see information about people that you already have access to through those social networks. So it's not like just because I'm using it in Office, I suddenly can see you know, my boss's uh, Facebook feed or my boss can see mine. It's only about um, 
what I already have access to. It's just showing it to me there in Outlook. So I don't necessarily need to go to Facebook to do it. In terms of the multiple pieces of contact information, um, that would be information that I put in. So you know, say I create one contact with um, Molly's cell phone number, and then I have another contact that I saved from the company directory with her work number and her email address at work. Outlook does have some logic built into it that it, um, there are varying degrees of confidence that Outlook will have that this is actually the same person. And so in some situations, it might automatically link that. Like if I put in two different email addresses in two different contacts, it figures email address is a pretty solid indicator of a single person. So it will link that. Um, if there are other things that it might not be totally confident mean it's the same person, it might give me the option to link it or give me sort of a suggested link um, that I might want to make that connection to show it on a single card, but let me make that decision. And then of course, if there is disparate contact information for maybe you know, one, one piece of contact information is about Robert and the other one is Bob, uh, and Outlook wouldn't necessarily know that it's the same person, I could manually create that link. So there are a lot of different options for it, but it's all about the information that I provide or that I already have access to. Great. And I think that we've already um, touched on this a little bit, but we have had a couple of questions on this, is whether or not Office um, is or will ever be available on your iPad. Yep. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, I think for the earlier question, we already have uh, OneNote and Link available for the iOS platform, so for both iPad and iPhone. Um, I don't have anything to share at this time about uh, other Office applications for, for the iOS platform or Android platform at this time. Um, but you can see from the fact that we have two apps out there that you know, it is something that we are aware of that customers are using other platforms and we want to be a great productivity experience. So, um, uh, so that's, about, that's about what I'll say there. Okay, great, thanks. Arthur was wondering, do you have to have a touch screen to use the new Office? And I think this is just a bit of time for Emphasize what the answer to that would be. Yeah, so no, you do not have to have a touch screen to use the new Office. Uh, and a great um, example of that is the fact that Office 2013 is available on Windows 7, uh, as we discussed before. And touch screen devices were a lot less common with Windows 7 uh, uh, devices than with Windows 8 devices. Um, and so everything that I showed with touch can be done with a mouse and keyboard. And of course, you can continue to do all the things that you've been used to doing uh, with mouse and keyboard. So there are just certain types of activities that because we now have touch becoming a more and more common paradigm, we've made it, we've integrated that into the Office experience, but not uh, without cutting anything out that you're used to with mouse and keyboard, if that makes sense. That totally makes sense. We've also had quite a few questions about Publisher, wondering if it's new improved in, in, office, in the new office or if it is even included in the new office. Uh, yeah, so things that I didn't uh, do demos of, whether it's uh, InfoPath, Access, Publisher, um, uh, uh, and, and whatnot, all, those are still available. We have new versions of all of that as well. There's only so much I can, I can show in a 20-25 in a minute demo. <laughs> um, but yes, all of, the, all of the products in the Office portfolio have been refreshed for this new version for Office 2013. Um, and actually, it's worth noting that this is the first release uh, from Microsoft where every single product in the Office portfolio has been uh, redeveloped and released in the same time frame. And that means the client products, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, OneNote, Access Publisher, all those client products, as well as the server products, Exchange, SharePoint, Link. Uh, some of you may recall in the 2010 versions, Exchange launched uh, a number of months before SharePoint launched, and they were on different engineering cycles. Well, in this 2013 release, all of them were engineered on the same time frame, which meant that a lot of the product engineering teams could actually work together to do a lot of uh, scenarios that cross product. That again, 
really let people focus on these flows that maybe they don't really care whether they're in email in Exchange or in the document uh, collaboration and, and storage world, which is SharePoint. They just want to get work done and collaborate on documents or communications together. And so having all of those products engineered on the same time frame for this 2013 release actually has let us do a lot more cross-product things that really make the stack kind of a 1 plus 1 equals 3 situation when you have the new version of Office and all the portfolio there. Okay, great. Thank you. We've also had a, quite a few questions about migrating from old Office, office versions. So um, David was wondering how difficult is it to migrate from an old Office version such as Office uh, as she did, she did 2003 to the new Office. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, one of the things I think that actually is really exciting about the new version of Office and, and it being um, and doing so much work for uh, the cloud in particular is Office, uh, the new version of Office the, um, can now basically run uh, and be streamed onto your computer and run side by side with previous versions of Office. Um, and so that actually has helped a lot of customers with what is typically a very uh, strong problem, which is um, compatibility of maybe certain line of business applications that have been developed internally for things like uh, um, you know, Exchange uh, or SharePoint or you know, specific uh, macros that have been developed in Excel or other things like that. And so being able to actually run versions uh, of Office side by side with the new version of Office um, lets you help deal with that compatibility because if there's uh, a line of business application or a macro or something that um, hasn't been validated to work with the new Office yet, you can just open it in the old version of Office that you're, uh, that where it does work um, and not actually delay that upgrade process. So you can have them running side by side and use the new version for everything that you need uh, or everything that you can do there. Uh, and if it's something that's a compatibility issue, you can just revert back to the previous version uh, until that uh, custom application is ready, uh, ready to be upgraded. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm go going to just cover one more question because we are getting to close to the top of the hour. Again, if any Buddy's question did not get answered either via chat or audibly. Um, we will be um, making sure that those questions get to um, Ginny, who will be um, trying to kind of sort through everything. Um, we will get back to you one way or another. Um, it might just take us a little bit of time because there are a lot of questions. Um, but to close out, um, I do want to ask both Ginny and David what you. This question is from Joanna, who's wondering what you think the most useful new feature for Office is? Um, I've been talking for a while. Janine, do you want to start and then I'll follow up? Sure, no problem. So I think actually the most useful feature is um, just how easy it is to format images. <laughs> I, I just I like really enjoy seeing my text automatically sort of reflow with um, the images. It just it saves me so much time. Um, and I'd also add that um, I really like how I can use OneNote. I'm a cross-platform person, so I use Windows and I use iOS, and I actually also have an Android tablet. And so I really like the, being able to use OneNote across all those different devices using the various OneNote apps. I think that's really cool. Cool. I, um, for me, I would actually say um, the Flash Fill feature that I showed in Excel has save me tons of time. Um, I, I do a fair amount of work with spreadsheets, and I'm taking data in and, in and out of spreadsheets. And just to be able to have a column of data that isn't the way I want it, and recreate just the pieces of data in the next column over that is in the format I want with only the data that I want, saves me a ton of time. Um, and so I, I, I have been astonished, actually, that it, it um, it's been a lot of fun to use, actually. It's, it's sort of like magic sometimes. Um, but yeah, I'd say that's probably one of my favorite features. Great. Thank you. Thank you both, Jenny and David, for those great answers. Um, with that, I do want to start kind of closing this out. Um, again, if you have any questions that you didn't get to even ask, I will be sending out a link to a TechSoup forum that you'll be able to post questions there. Um, I do want to take a moment to just thank Microsoft for the participation in this webinar and, of course, for um, being such a wonderful um, donor partner for us. Um, and 
I want to thank all of the presenters today. I want to thank David, Ginny. I want to thank everybody on the back end, so Becky, Cameron, Gretchen, and Don. Um, again, if you want to find out more information about um, new Microsoft Office products that are available through the Microsoft Software Donation Program, um, you can go ahead and go to this bit.ly that's showing on your screen right now. Um, don't worry about writing it down. I will be sending it out to you this afternoon along with the recording of today's um, webinar, a transcript, and any other applicable documents or links. Um, but again, uh, thank you to everybody for attending from TechSoup. Again, TechSoup is part of TechSoup Global, and we are trying to um, work towards a day where everybody, nonprofits, libraries, and social benefit organizations have all the technology and technology resources that um, they need to fulfill their, their potential and mission. And just as a reminder, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, just like so many of you. We really do try to um, get you what you need. And again, thank you to Microsoft, and thank you to our ReadyTalk, um, ReadyTalk our webinar sponsor, for providing this great, great platform today. And again, thank you to all of our participants. I really, really appreciate you taking this hour out of your day to spend with us. Again, if you have any other additional questions, just ask those questions at the forum that I will be sending out um, later today. And when you leave today's webinar, um, if you could just take a couple of minutes and fill out the survey, that should pop up. And if it doesn't, it will be in that follow-up email as well. That survey really does help us in bettering our webinar offerings and other offerings here at TechSoup. So again, thank you, David, and thank you, Ginny. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. Thank you. It's a pleasure talking to everyone. Okay. I hope everybody has a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's webinar. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your line. Okay, thank you.